The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. While the people were listening to Jesus speak, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately there. So he said, A nobleman went off to a distant country to obtain the kingship for himself and then to return. He called ten of his servants and gave them ten gold coins and told them, Engage in trade with these until I return. His fellow citizens, however, despised him and sent a delegation after him to announce, We do not want this man to be our king. But when he returned after obtaining the kingship, he had the servants called to whom he had given the money to learn what they had gained by trading. He, the first came forward and said, Sir, your gold coin has earned ten additional ones. He replied, Well done, good servant. You have been faithful in this very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. Then the second came and reported, Your gold coin, sir, has earned five more. And to this servant, too, he said, You take charge of five cities. Then the other servant came and said, Sir, here is your gold coin. I kept it stored away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you are a demanding man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you harvest what you did not plant. He said to him, With your own words I shall condemn you, you wicked servant. You knew I was a demanding man, taking up what I did not lay down and harvesting what I did not plant. Why did you not put my money in a bank? Then on my return I would have collected it with interest. And to those standing by he said, Take the gold coin from him and give it to the servant who has ten. But they said to him, Sir, he has ten gold coins. He replied, I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now as for these, those enemies of mine who did not want me as their king, bring them here and slay them before me. And after he had said this, he proceeded on his journey to Jerusalem. The Gospel of the Lord. A lot of slaying in our scriptures this morning. Uh, I want to continue uh, the meditation I started yesterday, reflecting on martyrdom, martyrdom and persecution. And I, what I want to do this morning is actually just read a, sec, a little section from uh, this book that I mentioned yesterday, Tortured for Christ. In particular, I remember when I was reading this, this is the section that, that just stopped me in my tracks, and I, I just kind of sat in these pages for a few, well, honestly, it's been a few months now just um, dumbfounded by what Richard Warmbrand had to say about his experience there with the Soviets and the Gulag. Um, there are Christians right now who are being persecuted. There are Christians right now this morning who are going to Mass who are not going to make it home because that's the environment in which they live, and yet they go anyway. This section here is called, How Can We Be Joyful Even in Prison? All right, so indulge me here for a few moments where I just lead us in this little meditation. When I look back at my 14 years in prison, it was occasionally a very happy time. Other prisoners and even the guards very often wondered how happy Christians could be under the most terrible circumstances. We could not be prevented from singing, although we were beaten for this. I imagine that nightingales too would sing, even if they knew that after finishing, they'd be killed for it. Christians in prison danced for joy. How could they be so happy under such tragic conditions? I meditated often in prison about Jesus' words to his disciples. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. The disciples had just come back from a tour through Palestine where they had seen horrors. Palestine was an oppressed country. Everywhere there was a terrible misery of tyrannized people. The disciples met sickness, plagues, hunger, and sorrow. They entered houses from which patriots had been taken to prison, leaving behind weeping parents and wives. It was not a beautiful world to look upon. Still, Jesus said, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. That was because they had not seen only the suffering. They had also seen the Savior. For the first time, a few ugly worms, caterpillars that creep on leaves, understood that after this miserable existence, there comes life as a beautiful, multicolored butterfly, able to flit from flower to flower. This happiness was ours too. Around me, in prison, were Job's, some much more afflicted than Job had been. 
But I knew the end of Job's story, how he received twice as much as he had before. I had around me men like Lazarus the beggar, hungry and covered with boils. But I knew that angels would take these men to the bosom of Abraham. I saw them as they will be in the future. I saw in the shabby, dirty, weak martyr near me, the splendidly crowned saint of tomorrow. But looking at men like this, not as they are, but as they will be, I could also see in our persecutors a Saul of Tarsus, a future apostle Paul. And some have already become so. Many officers of the secret police to whom we witnessed became Christians and were happy to later suffer in prison for having found our Christ. Although we were whipped, as Paul was, in our jailers we saw the potential of the jailer in Philippi who became a convert. We dreamed that soon they would ask us, what must I do to be saved? And those who mocked the Christians who were tied to crosses and smeared with excrement, we saw the crowd of Golgotha who were soon to beat their breasts in fear of having sinned. It was in prison that we found the hope of salvation for the communists. It was there that we developed a sense of responsibility toward them. It was in being tortured by them that we learned to love them. A great part of my family was murdered. It was in my own house that their murderer was converted. It was also the most suitable place. So in communist prisons, the idea of a Christian mission to the communists was born. God sees things differently than we see them, just as we see differently than, an, than that of an ant. From the human point of view, to be tied to a cross and smeared with excrement is a horrible thing. Nonetheless, the Bible calls the sufferings of the martyrs light afflictions. To be in prison for 14 years is a long period to us. The Bible calls it but for a moment and tells us that these things are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This gives us the right to suppose that the fierce crimes of the communists, which are inexcusable to us, are lighter in the eyes of God than they are in our eyes. Their tyranny, which has lasted almost an entire century, may be before God, for whom a thousand years are like one day, only a moment of erring astray. They still have the possibility of being saved. The gates of heaven are not closed for them, neither is the light quenched for them. They can repent like everyone else, and we must call them to repentance. Friends, we have to have these stories in our minds and in our imaginations, in our hearts, for they're real. They are real. And they give witness to what we are doing here today. Let us pray that we would have the courage to enter into all of the white martyrdoms that the Lord is inviting us into today. That we would not avoid any moment to suffer for Christ we would offer it all. Amen.